patrons, uh, a colleague and, and, and friend of long standing, Professor Alex Zelinsky, and uh, Kim Osley, who is the New South Wales Defence Advocate, Air Vice Marshal Kim Osley. And unfortunately, one of our speakers, Chris Jenkins, phoned in this morning and said, I'm not feeling very well and therefore I should not come and present. So we have just scrambled to get a Zoom hook up, and if it works, we'll hear Chris. And if it doesn't, well, at least we try. So Chris is not able to be with us today. This is the theme of the seminar, and we have had, during the year, a constant series of presentations which have been connected with that. But if you have the chance, during the break or afterwards, could we urge you to have a look around the general uh, Anzac Memorial, particularly the new extension, We'd invite you to come over and have a look at the AUSI library, and in particular the 100th anniversary book and display that are uh, the emphasis at the moment. And if you can support us in any way, we would particularly welcome your help. All of our webcasts are on our website, and today is also being webcast live out through the Philforce app called The, uh, the Cove. So there is a very good opportunity to catch up or to look if that is not possible. And because we're recording it, we're just reminding people of that option for later. There's the acknowledgement of our thanks to our speakers today. And we very much acknowledge that they have tremendously busy schedules and they fitted us in. Thank you so much. Our moderator is Major General Paul Irving. Past President of Bruce New South Wales, Head of Defence Reserves Association, and so many other things that uh, I just get uh, bewildered at times by the range of stuff he's willing to take on. But Paul will be the moderator, and the formal opening of the conference is from Her Excellency uh, Margaret Beasley, our patron. And uh, I understand, where are you, John? Could you come, please? And we are now going to see the formal opening of the seminar by the patron. Bujiri Kamarua, Diane Babana, Kamarara Gadigal Nagara. Good afternoon to you all in the language of the Gadigal, the traditional owners of the land on which both the Government House and the Anzac Memorial stand. I pay my respects to Gadigal elders, past, present and emerging. As patron of the Royal United Services Institute of New South Wales, I'm delighted to open this afternoon's major seminar, Island Australia, Improving Resilience in a Rapidly Changing Region. The topic is timely, and the seminar provides an excellent opportunity to delve deeper into our defence stance and strategy, which, despite the headlines, involves so much more than submarines. In 1888, my predecessor, Governor Charles Carrington, became the first patron of what was then the United Service Institution of New South Wales. Carrington was a military man, in fact, a former Lieutenant Colonel of the Royal Buckinghamshire Infantry, and he would have naturally supported the main object of the institution at that time, which was the higher professional education of officers. He and his wife, Cecilia, also lived here at Government House and developed quite a reputation for fulfilling their social role with warmth and generosity. A story is told of how, in the 1887 celebration of Queen Victoria's Jubilee, they banqueted a thousand poor boys of Sydney, who received medals struck for the occasion and were modestly told by Carrington of his own family's humble origins in 18th century trade. Lady Carrington also established the Jubilee Fund to relieve distressed women, and her management of it surprised contemporaries by a business capacity with which women are rarely credited. Quite the power couple. And I am proud to continue that line of vice-regal patronage, and I thank this seminar's hosting organisation for their 133-year role of successfully informing debate on defence and security studies. If we didn't know it already, last year's 2020 Defence Strategic Update underlined the rapidly changing region we live in and the need for a defence policy that is, and I quote, agile and adaptive. It refers to factors such as military modernisation in the Indo-Pacific, expanding cyber capabilities in the region, the undermining of confidence in the rules-based order and the conduct of grey zone activities, 
as factors that are making our security environment much less benign than it was only five years ago at the time of the 2016 Defence White Paper. Stepping back to take an even broader picture of change, participants in the CSIRO's 2019 Australian National Outlook explored multiple potential futures and identified contrasting scenarios for Australia looking ahead to 2060. They identified six challenges, or we could say opportunities, for our nation. The rise of Asia, technological change, climate change and environment, demographics, trust and social cohesion. These factors also have a direct bearing on the consideration of our national defence and security. To add another dimension, if you will, is the whole area of space warfare, which I was introduced to recently when researching the development of space law. In 2020, the US released its Defence Space Strategy, defining space as, and I quote, a distinct warfighting domain, essential for maintaining military superiority. Space has been used at least twice for anti-satellite testing, the last occasion being in 2019 when India conducted asset testing during the ire of the US, albeit with only a mild rebuke. India, of course, is a member of the Strategic Quad Alliance, which may explain why a stronger stance was not taken. Although the theme of this afternoon's seminar is fascinating, this subject matter is not abstract or merely academic. An appropriate response to change is vital for our prosperity and welfare. Sound decisions are required, coupled with the right actions. I wish you well for your deliberations this afternoon, as you enjoy the expertise of an impressive complement of high-profile speakers, including Commander Australian Fleet, Commander Forces Command, Air Commander Australia, Commander Second Division, the New South Wales Defence Advocate, CEO of Thales Australia in New Zealand, and the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Newcastle. I commend the organising committee, and I thank RUSI New South Wales Vice Patrons for their support. I now declare the seminar formally open, and I look forward to the important updates to come through the webcasting of content and publication of these proceedings. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you can see it's a very packed program, uh, and therefore, in, uh, due to the time constraints, I'm not going to provide a summary of the history and the bio of uh, our, uh, our next four speakers. Nevertheless, let me say that as all senior commanders of the ADF, uh, they are standing officers, otherwise they wouldn't have been appointed to the positions that they now hold. They've all had a wealth of experience uh, within, and within their respective service, they essentially command the vast majority of combat elements of the three services, as well as all the significant weapon platforms that the services hold. For each of these officers, I'm sure that this senior command appointment will probably be your most rewarding appointment, uh, because you're dealing with the, the, the wonderful men and women of the Australian Defence Force. And importantly, you exercise your command somewhat physically removed from the Canberra bubble, uh, which, uh, you people, is a unique circumstance we have in Australia, where the people in Canberra think the whole of Australia is tuned into what is going on in Canberra, uh, to the exclusion of the rest of Australia. So without further ado, I'll ask uh, Rear Admiral Hammond to present to us this afternoon. Thank you. Of national and regional economic and security resilience. 
Today, as is the case almost every day, nearly 2,000 men and women of the Royal Australian Navy are at sea. In 22 ships and submarines, with more than 800 personnel force assigned to the Chief of Joint Operation, serving from the coast of Australia as far north as the waters of Japan. These people provide the visible embodiment of Australian government policy across the Indo-Pacific region. And despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, Royal Australian Navy ships and submarines have maintained our commitment to training, certification and operational activities across the Indo-Pacific, from Canada and the United States to the east, India and Sri Lanka to the west, and Japan and South Korea to our north. Your Navy's resilience and professionalism is underlined by the fact that these operations have been carried out despite the ever-present risk of COVID-19. Sometimes crews have deployed from cities in lockdown, such as Sydney, leaving families behind to face the challenges alone while our crews deploy for disaster relief and other operations, conducting contact and support visits, and sometimes returning again months later straight into lockdown in their home port. It is true, this is a demanding operating context, and we should all be proud of the professionalism and resilience of our people. That said, our service isn't about personal challenges. Service is about overcoming personal challenges in order to serve a higher purpose. And in this context, I'd like to show you a short video clip. Uh, it's really important that we continue to be able to operate both domestically and overseas, despite um, the environment that a COVID pandemic results in. Despite that, um, I'm really proud of the way the ship's company have been able to demonstrate their resilience and their skill uh, and their commitment to the region to be able to push through the challenges that such a deployment presents. So there was a request by New South Wales Health for the ADF assistance um, to help with the vaccination outreach and rollout through that region. Um, that was done urgently as a result of the COVID-19 Delta outbreak that was spreading through New South Wales. The Defence Force stood up 70 personnel very quickly um, and deployed those personnel out into from Dubbo and out from there out into the Western New South Wales Area Health. Um, and those 70 personnel were then divided into five vaccination outreach teams who were deployed in support of New South Wales Health. The vaccination outreach teams were able to administer 50,600 vaccinations. Not only did they administer 50,000 odd vaccinations, but that meant they dealt with 50,000 plus members of the public, a community that was very afraid and frightened about their own health outcomes. And so it was a very rewarding experience to be part of. So not only did we result in 50,000 vaccinations delivered, but countless numbers of lives saved. And um, the tangible other effects were a high level of positive community engagement by the ADF with the New South Wales communities and a visible reduction in vaccine hesitancy. Basically, we were at sea already. Um, there was talks of a uh, uh, cyclone in Fiji and not long after we got a pipe from the captain and he, like, he confirmed that we were going to Fiji. We didn't have very long to prepare. I think it was a day turnaround that they gave us. So yeah, we basically just got the ship ready to go and then we left. It, it was honestly the most rewarding thing that I've done in my career. Um, I think th these are the sorts of trips that me personally, I joined for. Uh, I remember in 2016, a similar thing happened in Fiji. They had um, Cyclone as well, and Canberra went for that one. And I, I was still in training, so I wasn't able to go or anything like that. But I remember just one, like saying to myself, these are the types of trips that I want to go on. And so I was really grateful to be able to go. And being from Fiji, it meant a whole lot to me. Australians to avoid the effects of bushfires or floods, 
or deploying into the region to provide emergency relief after cyclones and earthquakes. Our people understand that our strength is founded on not only our resilience, but also that of our neighbours. When the safety, well-being and resilience of our neighbours is at risk, our people answer the call selflessly. So there is a strong connective tissue between personal, professional and national resilience. But your Navy also plays a key role in enabling and protecting our economic resilience, a vital national security concern. We are a maritime nation. This land, earth by sea, relies on the freedom of the maritime commons for our prosperity. We are the fifth largest user of shipping services globally. Over 98% of our imports and exports and over 79% by volume are dependent upon shipping that travels through the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Our financial system is largely enabled by the many intercontinental cables that run along the sea floor. In pre-COVID terms, this trade accounted for over $600 billion per annum, making relevant geography in the maritime commons our vital national terrain. As the great maritime strategist Alfred Mahan said, seaborne commerce and naval power are meshed together, with the Navy providing security on the sea. In this sense, when risks accrue within the maritime commons, risks accrue also accrue to our national economy. And when those risks morph into national security risks, the relevance and strength of our Navy becomes a national talking point. COVID-19 has impacted seaborne global supply chains, while regional tensions centred on sovereignty claims and differing interpretations of the law of the sea present potential risks to maritime trade, depending on which commentator you listen to. Collectively, though, these issues manifest as risks to our economic well-being and resilience, and in this context, the efficient and effective flow of maritime trade across the, across the global commons, indeed across the Indo-Pacific, is a vital national concern, and key regions across the global commons are our country terrain. So, understanding and monitoring trends and issues So understanding and monitoring the trends and issues across our vital terrain is central to our national, economic and in turn security resilience. To our north lies the extraordinarily complex and diverse Indonesian archipelago, our gateway to Southeast Asia. To its east, the Coral Sea, our gateway to the islands of the Southwest Pacific. And to our west lies the mighty Indian Ocean, our gateway to the subcontinent and beyond. These are the sea-based roads and suburbs that constitute our neighbourhood and your Navy is in many respects, along with our Army and Air Force partners, your neighbourhood watch. Walking these streets to enable our understanding of the contemporary maritime environment, enabling an assessment of emerging risks and issues across our vital terrain, and enabling our access to allies and partners despite the COVID-19 pandemic. This concludes my presentation, and although I focused on the Royal Australian Navy, in closing I would expand the aperture and offer to you that the personal and professional resilience of our people across the defence enterprise and their families is directly connected to national and regional resilience and the stability and well-being of our region, as I'm sure my fellow environmental commanders will undoubtedly attest. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much. Um, Your Excellency, uh, Rusi office holders, vice, fellow vice patrons, industry leaders, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon about the Forces Command contribution to, uh, to resilience. Now, let's see if I can get my slides. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to uh, thank you very much for the warm invitation to be able to speak this afternoon and share uh, the Forces Command perspective on how Army is improving our national resilience. But also extend a warm welcome to those uh, watching via the live stream being hosted by The Cove, which is our professional development uh, application for Army based here out of Victoria Barracks in Sydney. 
Um, I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I also pay my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have contributed to the defence of Australia in times of peace and war. Forces Command, with our headquarters here in Sydney and units all across Australia, uh, effectively comprises about 80% of Army, including all the brigades and training centres. Uh, Forces Command is charged to raise, train and sustain our Army for being a uh, peace and wartime activities as part of a joint force. In addressing the topic of how Forces Command is contributing to improving national resilience, I'd first like to speak about the changing nature of war and uh, the increased call for ADF assistance to national crises. I'll then talk about how Forces Command is creating mutually beneficial strategic partnerships with our communities and the region to give our people the social skills needed to enable the joint force in peace and war. The Fleet Commander has already described how the region is becoming increasingly complex, dynamic and contested, and our Army has always adapted to new challenges that have shown resilience, but we're now experiencing the change in the character of war at a much faster and faster rate. From an Army point of view, we call this accelerated warfare. In addition to these changes, in addition to these changes in our international environment, our government is increasingly turning to the ADF to uh, support the nation in times of crisis. In the past few years, the ADF has repeatedly been called upon to assist state authorities and emergency services in floods, fires, cyclones, and most recently, national uh, health pandemic. As extreme weather events and natural disasters are becoming increasingly frequent, the higher impact on our Australian community, it's likely the government will increasingly call upon the ADF to contribute to domestic and emergency response. Operating in challenging environments and needing to adapt to new ways is not new for our Defence Force. We've been doing it throughout our history, but the combination of accelerated warfare and increased requirement from the government to, for the ADF to support in times of national crisis has resulted in increased uncertainty for what the ADF needs to be ready for, and we expect this uncertainty to continue. For Army to succeed in this uncertainty, we need land forces that are prepared to respond to demanding and uncertain environments. Forces that are able to adapt quickly, to partner with not only the other services, but other government agencies and other militaries, and with capacity to take on an increasingly wider range of roles and tasks. These tasks could range from something as benign as COVID, uh, COVID contact tracing all the way up to complex war fighting against an adversary that has similar technologies and capability, as, to distinct, as distinct from the overmatch that we've enjoyed in recent uh, conflict. Being prepared to meet a range of tasks demanded in multiple contexts is what Army calls Army emotions and relies upon individuals building their individual and organisational resilience. Outside of wartime, we've perhaps never adapted as quickly as what we have over the past two years. COVID has shown the resilience of our army and indeed our three services. Like every other workplace, COVID has restricted um, our people's movement and tested their ability to get together to train in traditional ways. We've found ways to adapt our training, our operations and our routines to ensure continuity of our practices and maintain our readiness. Some ways COVID, in some ways, COVID has forced us to rethink how we conduct our training and to find efficiencies in our approach. We've seen that in the response to restricted border travel where army units located literally in every corner of the country have adapted their training methodology to decentralise training and, where appropriate, conduct training in an online sense. I'm proud of what Forces Command and indeed the broader Army have been able to achieve in this way while continuing to contribute to national response to, uh, to state and with state emergency services to the COVID crisis. In this way, we've been able to maintain preparedness also for not only COVID but for other contingencies. While Army harnesses and coordinates effects across all domains, including space and cyber, 
to secure the national interest and ensure sovereignty and human security, history shows at some point it's always necessary to put boots on the ground. Army is fundamentally a people-centric organisation and our people are for us our competitive advantage. We rely on their professional character, we rely on their uh, ethical and moral decision making and to remain accountable in order to maintain the trust that we, uh, that we currently enjoy with the community and with our country. This trust, this trust allows greater asset, our greatest asset, our people, to operate in and amongst the communities, to support, to secure, to influence, and if required, engage in combat um, amongst the population. This professional character is the essence of what we call good soldiering. Good soldiering enables Army to quickly form teams whenever, wherever and with whomever is needed to succeed. We can develop many of the moral and intellectual attributes required of our people within Army through our focused training efforts, education and experiences. However, these attributes encompass the development of character, leadership, communication, cognitive and interpersonal skills, but these can be further developed by enhanced uh, learning in other contexts, working with other partners. This is why strong partnerships are essential to build our capacity and resilience as an organisation. These partnerships span across local communities, our allies, regional partners, other government agencies, industry and academia. Army's partnerships expose our people to a variety of contexts to improve our ability to enhance the moral and intellectual capability of our people. Our Army's partnerships are the basis of our capacity, our strategic depth, our domestic security and support to national resilience. I now speak of some of the work across communities, across the region and our strategic partners that Army has undertaken. While there is uh, always a focus on developing our hard-edged warfighting capability, You'll see why exposing to our people to these other contexts helps our people to develop their soft skills, which is uh, what's required to be able to operate in and amongst communities. And how learning from and integrating uh, experiences gained from these environments ultimately helps to improve our performance and resilience. Army's people are from the community and they return to the community at the end of their period of service. We value that connection with the, with the nation and encourage our people to live, be active and give back to the communities whenever possible. Our engagement is multifaceted and multi, but also multi-beneficial, enabling Army to serve local communities while also developing our people's social skills through working with partners and supporting civilian populations in crisis. Despite a very restricted ability to engage with the communities in the past 12 months, Forces Command alone has engaged and supported in 247 different community activities across Australia. These engagements, of these engagements, 62% were with youth groups, including Indigenous groups, cadets, sporting activities and school visits. Another 26% of engagement was with veterans, groups, charities and family open days and the remainder were displays and ceremonial support. Not only do these activities develop social skills, relationships and empathy in our people, but they also support whole of government welfare and development programs to assist elements of our community to thrive. Supporting and giving back to our local communities is a staple for Army and something that will continue into the future. The, Aboriginal, the Army Aboriginal Community Assistance Program, or ACAP, began in 1997. ACAP programs and, uh, and the a ACAP project is a wonderful opportunity for our engineered trades to work with remote Aboriginal communities to construct housing, roads, sewerage facilities, airfields, telecommunications infrastructure, school facilities, potable water, the list goes on. In the last decade, this involvement has extended to coordination of health and veterinary training and the delivery of employable skills programs for those remote communities. ACAP reinforces the strong association between Army and the Indigenous peoples of Northern and Central Australia. 
to ensure we're connected with and understand our region, each of our brigades across Army and across Forces Command also have a habitual relationship with several of our smaller regional partners to focus on cultural understanding and to build enduring relationships. Regular exercises with these partners and others, including New Zealand, Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia and Indonesia enable our Army to train, support national engagement objectives and to contribute to nation building. We also know our future joint operations will comprise of coalition, uh, coalition force operations and interagency uh, engagements with numerous stakeholders. Therefore, we're also focusing our attention on engagements with major powers. Of course, uh, the US, UK, Japan, India, Canada, and the Republic of Korea. Additionally, we're increasing our interoperability with Australian organisations, including other government and civilian agencies such as DFAT, State Emergency Services, Academia, and Industry, all of whom are potential stakeholders in conceivable future operations. Operating in this wide variety of, with this wide variety of partners and varied environments is preparing us for those boots on the ground uh, roles that I described earlier, which I'll illustrate by sharing a recent story from a Townsville infantry soldier, Corporal Quinn Jensen. Corporal Jensen was part of the joint and interagency team that recently deployed at very short notice to Kabul Airport as part of the evacuation assistance for Australian passport holders and visa holders. Uh, out of Afghanistan just a few short weeks ago. In the year leading up to this deployment, Corporal Jensen, as part of his team, conducted a full cycle of warlike training activities culminating, culminating in the Joint International Exercise Talisman Sabre. While that warlike training certified Corporal Jensen and his team to be ready to deploy that year, uh, they also supported Operation COVID Assist tasks in Western Australia. They were involved in charity work with Legacy and Ronald McDonald House in Townsville and were also part of the local Townsville Crowd Warrior campaign, or Crowd Warrior program, for Indigenous and at-risk youth. When Corporal Jensen's team arrived on the ground in Kabul, they found themselves in confronting conditions. The Kabul airport had three entry gates, geographically dispersed by about eight kilometres, each congested with thousands of desperate people hoping to get out. The troops on the ground had quickly assessed the environment, develop a plan, and execute their mission. It was arduous, dynamic, and austere. They were operating for eight days with very little rest or sleep as part of a multinational interagency team. For a 12 hour period during that operation, Corporal Jensen found himself single handedly identifying and securing members and families from the vulnerable. Afghanistan women's soccer team, which consisted of approximately 20 family groups. He found a local English speaker who would translate and help him identify the team and their families as he worked his way through the crowd trying to pick them out and bring them through security to safety. He retrieved the soccer team from the press of the crowd and negotiated with various authorities for their safe package, passage to Australia and did so successfully. Those women and their families are now safe here in Australia. The capacity to negotiate difficult human terrain, often under conditions of heightened stress from environmental and other threat factors, was critical to the success of that Afghanistan evacuation operation. Australian soldiers must have skills to communicate in socially um, acceptable ways, develop understanding and foster empathy between people. Every soldier who read the non-verbal cues, every soldier who can read non-verbal cues, anticipate changes in atmospherics and find alternate ways to communicate adds significant value to achievement of the mission. Corporal Jensen highlights the criticality of land combatants um, developing soft skills that bridge the cultural and language barriers that often exist to gain access to parts of the population or groups that need our support. We know that in an era of accelerated warfare, our army must evolve to be more adaptable and ready to meet a greater range of roles and tasks that, all got, that the uh, government will require of us. 
Forces Command contributes to the building of national resilience through investing in our most important asset, our people, to develop them and the moral and intellectual attributes that they have to make Army more operationally relevant and competent, both nationally and internationally. We're doing this through win-win partnerships with the broadest range and broadest array of organisations and groups that we can muster. We know that we need to continue to evolve, but we'll look to our organisational response to COVID-19 and individuals like Corporal Jensen um, to demonstrate that our Army is already well on the way to achieving the resilience required from our Army to be future ready. Thanks very much. Thank you, General Pearce. Uh, while we're waiting for uh, to get the uh, body mic installed on the Vice Marshal of Arcee, I'll just point out that he's no stranger to the uh, to the uh, memorial, and he's now uh, the ADF's uh, representative on the trustees of the memorial, uh, and he also came to the Roosie Library in March this year when we rededicated uh, the book listing the 3,987 men from the RAAF from New South Wales who enlisted in the First World War, in the Second World War, sorry, and who paid the supreme sacrifice. So we welcome now to the, the, um, the podium Air Vice Marshal Barsi, who will in, uh, advise us in relation to the RAAF's uh, contribution to enhancing resilience in the context of our changing regional strategic situation. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, uh, firstly, uh, Excellency and distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, today. Uh, firstly, I acknowledge the, uh, the Dadic people of the uh, Eora Nation uh, upon the lands which we meet physically here today. For all those dialed in uh, across uh, the nation today, uh, I'll pay my respects to the, uh, the custodians and lands upon which you're meeting and doing this as well. I'll pay my respects to their elders past, present, uh, in emerging. I also acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and men who have uh, served our nation uh, in times of peace uh, and war. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to follow up uh, from both uh, my great uh, mates and compatriots uh, in both uh, Mark and, and Matt and uh, Fleet uh, and Forces Command. We come from uh, very similar backgrounds but we bring a, a nuanced approach to uh, the way we need to do business and, and that by and large is the sub-theme uh, of how I'll be talking about resilience from the air command perspective is actually that strength through diversity that provides us the, with the inherent resilience. But I'm going to start with a, a definition uh, of resilience and this is from uh, the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction uh, Manual. Resilience is the ability of a system, community or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate, adapt to, transform and recover from the effects of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including through the preservation and restoration of its essential basic structures and function. Now one could argue that uh, in this uh, centenary uh, year of our Air Force, and uh, thank you Mark for acknowledging the birthday again uh, there mate, um, that uh, it's in, inherent in the Air Force's DNA uh, to be resilient. Uh, between uh, its formation in 1921 through to the start of the Second World War, uh, our then uh, Chief of the Air Force, uh, Sir Richard Williams, spent a majority of his time arguing the case about the retention of an independent armed service uh, for the provision uh, of air power. So Air Force, uh, as part of its DNA, has always been uh, adapting to the environment uh, within which uh, it existed. But critically uh, for us, it actually comes down to one of um, are we resilient uh, by design uh, as an ADF uh, and in particular uh, as an Air Force? So what are the design criteria we need to uh, address those uh, attributes identified in that definition? Uh, now for us, uh, the ADF uh, in itself uh, and the uh, Air Force and Air Command is, is, a, is a medium to small entity. Uh, when you consider it uh, compared to other defence forces in the world. We are therefore not a defence force of mass. Uh, and so therefore, without mass as an inherent redundant or resilient measure, uh, how do we cope? 
We actually cope through resilience through quality. Uh, and critically important, our measure of success is quality. Quality of our systems and quality of our people as a resilient measure to adapt and cope to the environment as it changes over time. Uh, and as uh, we colloquially call within uh, Air Force, you know, it's, it's bombs on target on time, it's actually the, the, the delivery of quality and precise effects on time. And so our true measure of, of uh, resilience is our ability to be um, to deliver quality on time. So that they are pretty much the, the critical design criteria or principles for the defence force. Uh, within within Air Command, uh, in fact, uh, the governor highlighted in her opening address. Uh, never before in our careers has there been such an alignment uh, from strategy down the task in terms of what we need to do. From the defence strategic update with the three strategic defence objectives to shape, deter, respond, through the four structure plan which outlines uh, major capital uh, uh, acquisition projects uh, and importantly for our government uh, talking about uh, reaching out and touching uh, others uh, that might be our competitors uh, within uh, our part of the world. Uh, and then uh, finally, the Defence Transformation Strategy, which talks about the way the Defence Force needs to reform. So in any way, these three documents represent uh, strategy, capability and reform. Within Air Command, we view those aspects about three key questions we need to ask ourselves. Are we relevant? Are we credible and are we reliable? The test of relevancy is the one about uh, are we doing what is actually expected uh, of us? And so that's maintaining uh, a, a key alignment and being attuned not only to uh, our government and our government's expectations but more broadly uh, across the world. Uh, the ADF in Australia, uh, if you consider it like a, a biological uh, entity, uh, exists it doesn't exist in its own ecosystem, it connects with other ecosystems around. So in order to be able to adapt quickly, we need to have uh, enough spidey sensors out there that we're attuned to the environment within which we are in, which it goes beyond just taking uh, specific directions from government to say, ADF do, uh, ADF must also think. Uh, but in order to think and be prepared, not only do you need uh, those spidey sensors out there from uh, a diverse and inclusive uh, workforce. Uh, you also uh, need to have that from, but how far out uh, are you looking as well? The motto with an air command is to be alert and ready, but as we colloquially say, you can't be ready if you're looking at your shoes, you can only be ready if you're looking ahead. So our ability to be resilient is also our ability to predict or uh, give uh, great military judgments about the world within which we live uh, and those things that might be changing and how quickly we can adapt to that change. So therefore, we need to be looking sufficiently far enough ahead to give us sufficient indicators and warnings about uh, is the system we've created uh, remaining relevant over time? How far ahead do we look? Uh, we've got um, uh, plenty of folk employed within uh, the Department of Defence that are involved in strategy. Uh, outside of the, the 10 year uh, bracket, uh, they're the, the big hands, little map type of uh, folk that give us the general steer about where we have a vision and where we want to point uh, our defence force. And that's fantastic. Uh, we need that uh, broader strategy and broader vision to give us a mean line of advance. For us in the, the force in being world, what's the force in being? That's the force that we have today because we fight with what we have, not what we wish we had uh, or what we think we've got. Um, that's what we deal with uh, in the world of reality. And our world really extends out to around about four years from a temporal perspective. Uh, why is it four years? Well, four years needs to be, it's, it's officially far ahead that it's real. Uh, and we can actually make real changes to the way we adapt uh, to our force, uh, whether it's changing the way we train uh, or new sparks of innovation and technology that we can rapidly install. Or they give us the indicators of the longer lead time items that we need to develop in the broader capability of and say, hey, guess what? We can't crack that nut now, handing over uh, other leaders in terms of uh, broader things we need to develop beyond that. But importantly, four years generally goes beyond the tenures that we have in our respective positions. 
And that four years is important. We always need to look beyond our tenure to ensure that we have a connection with uh, an, an evolution over time. So what is the role of the ADF? The, the ADF, uh, well, the Chief of Defence Force, the role of the Chief of Defence Force is to ensure the ADF as an institution endures over time and remains relevant, credible and reliable over time. And so therefore, you must always be looking ahead. And that's where uh, Mark, Matt and I uh, are challenged on a day-to-day -day perspective. Uh, are we picking up on those uh, changes to the environment? Are we evolving? Uh, and, and are we attuned to those changes? How do we articulate in a way that makes sense to our leadership? How do we articulate that in a way that makes sense to the government as well? So that's our first resilient factor, being attuned to the environment. The second theme about credibility, good at what we do, that's actually ensuring that uh, not only do we retain uh, the soft skills uh, that keep us attuned to the community and part of the community, but it's the soft skills that underpin uh, our hard edge as a defence force as well. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, as blunt as it may be, the defence force is the only mechanism uh, that the Australian government has to deliver hard power. Uh, the only branch that's authorised to kill people and blow stuff up uh, in blunt terms. And so at the end of the day, we need to ensure that we are able to do that uh, if called to do so. It doesn't mean that our sole focus is on that, but uh, when called to do so, we need to be prepared to do it as well. So being credible uh, also ensures that we're providing confidence to government that we can do so. How do we test ourselves about how credible we are? Well, part of it's actually uh, being relevant to the government and turning up to uh, the things that they require of us. Uh, and in the last uh, couple of years, uh, the Defence Force might be viewed through the lens of international rescue. Uh, there's no uh, mission, there's no task, there's no crises uh, too big and too small that we haven't demonstrated an adaptability to cope over time. Whether that's uh, uh, reconstitution efforts uh, through the Pacific nations, through uh, disaster response, uh, whether that has been through uh, the national and the, uh, the global pandemic and how we've uh, coped and put our people through to that. Uh, inherently, uh, our job is to do what government directs, but without taking away the point that if government directs us to do those hard things, we need to be good at that as well. The third thing there is about reliability. Uh, we say what we mean and we mean what we say. Uh, and uh, often, uh, defence has been criticised without being able to clearly articulate or having a lack of transparency in exactly about what it does. Why, is, why are you spending uh, $10,000 on a coffee machine, as an example, as a distortion from uh, the money and investment in time and people and resource uh, to be trained and prepared to do the difficult things uh, that we need to do as well? But that reliability is, is also keeping a connection to the community and keeping connection to uh, the taxpayer to say, well, we are still spending your money wisely and this is what it brings back to bear. Now, when we joined up uh, in, the, uh, in the mid to late 80s uh, and in the early 90s, the world was raging peace. Um, and uh, most of us uh, lived through that. Uh, it was a wonderful environment to be in, but there was always questions about uh, why do we need a defence force? Defence force has always been like an insurance policy, right? Unless you actually draw it upon your policy, you question how, why over time do you want to keep putting money towards it? So that's why we go back to theme one. We need to remain relevant. And though while those tasks might necessarily uh, be the hard edge that we require, it keeps us relevant to uh, our current government and keeps us relevant to the Australian nation uh, as well. But the things that we never predicted, and as uh, Matt articulated in his uh, points of the forces command, uh, I, don't, I don't think we could have actually predicted the incidental benefits we had of having a force deployed supporting a COVID task force. Uh, we had uh, women and men out, out there interacting with the Australian community and all types of the Australian community through all socioeconomic uh, means and needs. Uh, people through uh, stress, uh, people through um, uh, other factors going on in their lives, uh, and it's a true testament to the, uh, the women and men of the ADF uh, that they are able to show a great level of empathy and professionalism and provide support directly to um, their fellow Australians. And for the, all those involved in the COVID task force, I think all of them would come back and say, 
it's something that was deeply personal for them because they could see they were doing something that was benefiting Australians as well. So when the Australian populace can see that the Australian government and therefore the Australian Defence Force is there uh, supporting itself, it provides the Australian people a level of confidence that the Defence Force is actually doing a good job and actually represents the best of who we are. Uh, and they, therefore, that also provides a level of confidence about how capable, adaptable and resilient the nation is. And so whilst the military is just one part of national power, it is the most visible part of national power from a human dynamic perspective. And the level of confidence that provides from a national point of view about uh, us as a nation from an identity perspective is absolutely crucial. And the Defence Force's uh, reformation over the last 10 to 15 years in particular, uh, from a workforce perspective, from a diversity and inclusivity uh, perspective as well. Um, I look at the Air Force today, uh, and I'll, I'll steal a quote from a, a mate of mine, uh, the former Deputy Chief of Army, uh, Chandy Rawlins. I think he's still on the job right now. Uh, his quote was, you know, the Army he's in, the Army we have, we have today is the Army he wished he joined. And I have a similar view about the Air Force I'm in today. And the Air Force we're in today is kind of like the Air Force I wish I joined. We're a far more professional output, uh, out, outfit, we're attuned, uh, we understand, uh, but we are resilient in a way uh, that demonstrates confidence and trust back to the Australian people. But where's your evidence uh, of that? Well, I'll go back to, um, I'll go back a few years. The first vignette is um, August, uh, late August 2014. Um, we were just on the backward swing of the first peace dividend out of Afghanistan. Uh, the world was going into its next phase of raging peace and then uh, Iraq turned uh, sideways. Uh, we, at that particular point, the Australian government took a determination that uh, we needed to come to the aid uh, of Iraq and their collective self-defense. Uh, and what was colloquially, or what, not colloquially, what was titled Operation Opera was initiated. Uh, within uh, Air Command uh, in September 2014, we were given what normally for that type of mission set, we would have required a minimum of 35 days notice to move, to prepare our forces, train for the mission, certify and get going. Uh, as the operational commander at that point, uh, I had a call from uh, my chief saying, uh, congratulations Vinny, uh, we've got 28 days to go. We go, oh, that's going to be tight. Uh, 48 hours later, he gave me a call, uh, it's now 14 days ago, oh, that's even going to be tighter. Uh, 24 hours past, he goes, it's now seven days. Wow, that's going to be difficult. Now, we end up uh, deploying uh, an air task group as part of that joint force that encompassed the KC-30, uh, six Super Hornets, and the B-7. So we were actually, our force development had actually foreseen a need for us to be more self-sustained and alike. So we actually up stumps and moved ourselves to the Middle East within seven days. Astonishing. Within uh, an additional seven days, after the 14 day point from when we were given notice, we are actually operating within the theatre itself. Extraordinary. Seamlessly uh, tapped straight into that operation. Within 21 days of that notice, still, uh, that is 14 days inside of when we should have been uh, given notice to move, at the 21 day point, we dropped our first weapon on our first target. Now that's extraordinary and that couldn't have happened without the foresight of not only the capability of development, but the way we inherently train, uh, to be adaptable and capable to actually sequence in when we need to do it at whatever time. So that's the first demonstration of the hard edge of what how your defence force is currently posturing. The second example, is, as Matt's put out, is most recently with the non-combat evacuation operation uh, we had uh, most recently in Afghanistan. And it's a true credit to the women and men directly involved in that, that they have changed the lives of 4,100 Afghanis. Uh, changed the lives of 4,100 Afghanis, and no doubt the second and third order effects go into the tens of thousands of the indirect uh, benefits that have applied associated with that. But it was Friday the 13th, right? Friday the 13th of August, we got the call that uh, it's on. Um, and within 36 hours, uh, we actually had uh, personnel from a joint force moving uh, from this nation to get up and running. Now, why was that extraordinary at that time? 
Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've been living in a COVID environment uh, for the last uh, 18 months. So we actually had a complete workforce that was actually not physically at work. They were distributed, working from home, doing homeschooling. Uh, we had uh, a lot of our women and men deployed to the COVID task force in support of that as well. Uh, but we were able to gather them up and deploy a force forward in that 36 hour window. Absolutely astonishing. As a, as a minor segue there, over the preceding two years of operations through COVID, um, Air Force and Air Mobility Group, you know, the C-17s, KC-30s, our C-130s, our C-27s, the nature of air power is that we move, and we move between states and internationally. Every time we moved internationally between states, we incurred a quarantine bill based upon uh, each state's restrictions. As of today, uh, Air Command alone has accumulated over 200 years worth of human time in quarantine alone. And so leading up to that point on August the 13th, Friday the 13th, we had this accumulated uh, uh, fatigue uh, of people repeatedly going into and out of quarantine with one of our highest lead uh, humans having completed 160 days worth of quarantine uh, in one calendar year. Uh, so we had been going on, uh, we had a very attuned uh, workforce, we knew uh, who was capable and who wasn't and how we'd get up and running. So the fact that in 36 hours of that task we're up and running and we deployed was extraordinary. Also given the fact that that workforce had to come across from states as well, so they couldn't even concentrate together before they deployed. Uh, they all consolidated at our Middle East base in Minhad, they got together, they adapted, uh, and uh, you know, as they say, the rest uh, is history. Once again, we should underpin uh, the confidence we have in not only the quality of the process we have, but the quality of the humans we have to be able to rapidly adapt uh, and adjust. Where are we going uh, moving forward and what's important for us? Um, there's a good book by a guy called Ed Catmull, who is the president of uh, Pixar and Disney Animation. When I was going through an airport um, one day, back in the days when we could fly, um, uh, I just wanted something to read on the way through there. And as I went through the news agent, there was a book there that had a picture of Buzz Lightyear on the front. I go, well, that should be light reading. I'll, I'll grab that one. Because uh, uh, I wasn't uh, in for a, an in-depth uh, reading at that point. Now, Ed Catmull, who started up uh, Pixar Animation, the ones that were responsible for Toy Story, um, he actually did an analysis about what made Pixar uh, successful and actually what made big companies successful. But importantly, what actually made big companies at the height of their power fail as well. Uh, and here's the thing. Um, when Pixar developed Toy Story, um, it was incredible, right? Um, and it was uh, a world-leading uh, product. They went to develop two, Toy Story 2. They thought they had a repeatable process and they thought they actually had things that they could actually uh, get, they had a winning formula. They almost broke their company because what they failed to recognise was as a first of type event, uh, all their employees were willing to do whatever was necessary to actually make that successful. And so the key part for us from a resume's perspective is we need to always be checking our homework. Just because an entity or an event was successful we need to understand and analyse the reasons why it was successful and is it actually repeatable and sustainable over time. And so the true test of how we've seen uh, we are as a nation is checking our own homework. Uh, it's great to get the platitudes and pats on the back, but the key part that uh, we've always taken and certainly I take home is that you're always blind to something that's going wrong, it's just your ability to see. It. And that's the key part for us being resumed as a nation are we looking deliberately at the things that we know aren't working? And are we looking hard enough and asking ourselves the tough questions about are we truly resilient and are we adaptable as well? So we need from time to time, not just that we need to check our own homework, but equally important, we need to get others to check our homework uh, as well. So that's been a bit of a journey through left and right field uh, as it has looked through the uh, eyes uh, of the Air Commander. What I tried to outline to you uh, uh, folks today, uh, and I thank you for your time, uh, is that we are completely aligned uh, within the Defence Force about what's necessary. Uh, we have uh, wonderful women and men of the 
whom you shall all be proud of uh, as well. They are extremely capable, uh, but the, the key to our success is always being attuned to our environment. Uh, our strength through diversity, our strength through insights, our strength through partnerships uh, with our nearer nations. And that's the final point I'd say as well. We live in a complete ecosystem that we need to be attuned to what's going on elsewhere. Um, one, of the, one of the things we have in the bio community, we talk about how do you gain situational awareness. You gain most situational awareness by listening, not by talking. So we say when we engage with the region, we need big ears and little mouth. Uh, and so we need to be attuned to what really matters to those within our region to work out ways that we can actually best partner with them as well. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you uh, once again for the opportunity to present here uh, today. Uh, hopefully we present you with uh, an opportunity to glean uh, across the ADF, but uh, hopefully what you've seen is that you've got a very capable uh, ADF uh, who aren't resting on our laurels and we're always uh, willing to adapt and change. Thank you. <coughs>
destroying lives and property, the ADF provided high levels of support, culminating in 1,500 tasks completed across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, Western Australia, South Australia and the ACT. More than 8,000 Australian Defence Force members were deployed on Operation Bushfire Assist. As noted in the Royal Commission into Natural Disaster Arrangements on 28 October 2020, conducted in the aftermath of the bushfires, that the primary role of the ADF is defending and protecting Australia. Although not its primary role, the ADF provides assistance through its capabilities and resources during and after natural disasters. In some cases, ADF assistance is significant, such as during and in the aftermath of the 2019-2020 bushfires. It is important to note that the warfighting skills of the Australian Defence Force form a critical component of capability in the ADF's ability to respond to short notice domestic contingency. Added to this is the widespread geographic footprint of the ADF and its close links to community and partner agencies. This allows the ADF to respond effectively and quickly when called upon by government to support states in meeting these challenges in emergency situations. During Operation Bushfire Assist, Army Private Jonathan Amy, a Cooma local, returned to support his home community as a heavy vehicle operator hauling a water purification desalination system and said at the time, it's actually thrilling being able to assist my community and the district. There's a very common reaction from ADF members supporting the communities. The call out for ADF reserves was not only, was not the only unprecedented aspect of Operation Bushfire Assist. The headquarters of three formations of the Army 2nd Division were tasked to lead joint task forces across three jurisdictions simultaneously. A step change to using extant headquarters within the communities where the ADF support is required. Reservists drawing upon their connection to community and civilian skills contributed a civil military mindset that enhanced the ADF's overall response. Current commander of the Joint Task Force 629 and former commander of the Joint Task Force in New South Wales, Brigadier Mick Garraway has said that working with a partnered force and partnered organisations with damage commensurate with the battlefield not only provides excellent preparation for conventional operations, but the ADF's reserve brought much higher degrees of awareness of the human terrain. On Anzac Day this year, the small New South Wales coast town of Eden invited members of the 5th Engineer Task Force and HMAS Supply back to thank them for their service to the town and region during the bushfires. Eden RSL Subbranch Secretary Tony Larkin said, it is a real privilege to welcome five ER and the Navy back to Eden this year, not to see the devastation they helped to fight against, but to see how we Eden Aussies fight back, to see the green after the black. As mentioned earlier, the ADF has a long and proud heritage of assisting communities in response to natural disasters. And even as recently as 2019, more than 3,000 ADF personnel, largely drawn from the 3rd Combat Brigade in Townsville, assisted recovery operations in flood-affected North Queensland. From March to April this year, the ADF provided support to communities during New South Wales floods and subsequently supported communities after tropical cyclone Sarosia in Western Australia. Throughout June and July this year, the ADF supported storm recovery in Victoria's Denonong Ranges, and as the Chief of Army emphasises, it just demonstrates how much we are an army for the nation and an army in the community. Most strikingly, since March 2020, the ADF has played a pivotal role in contributing to a whole of government response to the COVID-19 pandemic with scalable support to state and territory authorities as part of Operation COVID-19 Assist. During this operation, the ADF has supported a wide range of tasks, including mandatory state and territory hotel quarantine, support to health and law enforcement authorities, ensuring home quarantine compliance, as well as providing welfare support, frontline COVID-19 swab testing, and support to mass vaccination hubs, contact tracing, planning, and logistical support, support to state and territory police at vehicle checkpoints, vaccination support to age and disability care facilities, 
In central and western New South Wales, the fence vaccination teams have provided more than 50,000 vaccinations to remote, rural and Indigenous communities. Another task of the ADF has been the support to numerous charities and NGOs such as Food Bank and Oz Harvest with the preparation and distribution of food and care packages destined for the most vulnerable in the community. The president of the Sikh charity Turbans for Australia, Mr. Amar Singh said that without the ADF support, he and his fellow volunteers would not have been able to manage the delivery of 1500 care parcels each week. As noted by Air Force Flying Officer Ryan Elliott, the ADF is supporting Turbans for Australia to help the community in its time of need. There is an expectation from the Australian community that the ADF will support government and emergency agencies responding to natural disasters at home when requested. For the ADF to respond effectively to support state agencies in their responses to natural disasters and contribute to Australia's civil resilience, we must focus on interoperability with emergency service in both training and on operations at a state and local level. As outlined by the Australian Institute for Disaster Resilience, the interconnectedness of systems in society causes cascading consequences in emergencies. Effectively managing risks therefore requires all sectors of society to plan for emergencies. At a national level, the Australian government plans to support emergencies that are severe and catastrophic in nature and are likely to overwhelm state and territory authorities' capacity to respond. Likewise, state and territory governments plan and prepare for natural disasters in their jurisdictions, cascading down to regional and local government as part of the emergency management framework. As identified in the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, the ADF is required to enhance its support of civilian authorities, and this is achieved by strengthening partnerships with authorities in the states and territories. Key lessons from the Royal Commission have been that it is essential for the Australian Defence Force to persistently maintain relationships with the state and territory emergency management framework, rather than in response to a crisis. The importance of these enduring relationships was voiced by New South Wales Police Deputy Commissioner Mike Willing when he said that, working with the ADF during the 2019-20 bushfire crisis is a great example of the benefits of joint agency approach. Since then, because of the relationships, the respect and understanding we have for each other, this approach has, in my view, helped to save the state of New South Wales time and time again. To further develop these partnerships and in the lead up to the upcoming high risk weather season, my headquarters recently partnered with the Australian Civil Military Centre to host a symposium to share lessons learned from previous and current domestic operations joined by Emergency Management Australia and partner agencies. The focus was on collaboration and building and maintaining enduring relationships front and centre. The Army's second division is uniquely placed within the Australian Defence Force and Australian Army to provide the command and control architecture and local force elements to meet short notice domestic operational requirements across Australia. Using our formation headquarters in each of the mainland states, with additional nodes in Tasmania, the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory. The division maintains long-standing and enduring communal links, in addition to a proven capacity to respond to short notice domestic crises whilst leveraging on reserve units based in the community. Of particular importance related to the ADF's response to domestic operations, has been the establishment of Joint Task Force 629 in March last year. This national Joint Task Force was initially raised by the Chief of the Defence Force to command force elements for Operation COVID Assist, largely drawing upon the second division, but also including large contributions from all three services. As the ADF's contribution to Operation COVID Assist draws to a close, Joint Task Force 629 has been retained will continue to provide the command and control along with the state and territory based joint task group headquarters for the ADF support to domestic operations during the high risk weather season. The ADF has contributed significantly to enhancing the nation's resilience for a long time, 
It has become more prominent in the past two years with the scale and scope of ADF support for the concurrent bushfires, floods, cyclones, storms, and an enduring pandemic. The ADF continues to maintain its readiness and preparedness for support to domestic operations to provide the support to government and the community in their time of need. I conclude with the words of 70-year-old Darcy Osborne, who joined fellow Tarry New South Wales residents waving the Australian flag when a convoy of ADF vehicles entered his flood-ravaged town in March this year. It fills me with pride to see the road filled with camouflage uniforms and lots of vehicles and support. It is like the cavalry coming, our emergency services, fire department, <coughs> police force, ambulance service and SES, and now to have the strength of the ADF to complement their efforts. Thank you for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got some te technological issues that we can't have general time money in on the question. So I'd ask our Navy, Army and Air Force uh, uh, speakers to come forward and sit on the, the, the seats out the front. We might bring them forward. I've got a series of questions here to raise with them. So gentlemen, the first question. For Australia to contribute significantly to the emerging national alliances and partnerships now developing within our region, Milan, can I just speak on? For Australia to contribute significantly to the emerging national alliances and partnerships now developing within our region, what would you identify as the critical capabilities to be selected as early priorities for improvements or acquisition? So, uh, someone's got a mic on? Yes, okay. So, does, does anybody wish to start on the relation to that question, please? Sure, I'll buy it. Um, Look, in my view, it starts and ends with people, right? The, the true capability uh, of our defence force is our people, their character, their quality, but also the quantity. Uh, and it's very, very hard to build a high-tech defence force quickly. Uh, high-tech ships take six to seven years to build, but so do the operators. So the first thing that I, I always look for is that the human resource numbers, numbers in, numbers out. Um, and that's also the capability that connects us to our partners and allies, it's that human capability. So first and foremost, it's people. Uh, and then in terms of platforms, it's the technology piece. I would just say, we need to understand our capabilities in context. Some things you can buy off the shelf really quickly, others, it takes you up to 20 years to build. So we've got to make sure that as we look to uh, re-energize or transform uh, or adapt our organizations for the challenges of today, we get after those things with a sense of urgency that take time and we prioritise the application of resources accordingly. Yeah, so I'd, I'd echo exactly those comments and probably the only thing I'd add is you can only go at the pace of trust. So uh, the, the people to people connections that we now have throughout the region are really important to continue to invest in. You can't uh, allow them to wither on the vine for a period of time and then expect to be able to pick up again at the uh, location that you were. So it's a continual investment and, um, and there's mutual benefit to it. Every partner force that we work with has got uh, particular strengths that we always learn from and, and things that we can also share with them. So I, I agree with, uh, with the fleet commander. I don't think it's necessarily platform centric for us. So I, I think it's really around people. Yeah, not more to add uh, outside of the, the comment I made during my presentation. It's about listening, first and foremost. What is it that they see uh, as essential for their security and prosperity? Um, it, whilst the Defence Force have wonderful skilled people and capability, uh, it's not always about creating a Defence Force, uh, even in our own shape throughout the region. It's a case of we had some skills that might contribute from a civil sense as well. And so uh, we have a broader range of skill sets other than just the delivery of hard power. That's a contributor for overall security uh, within the region as well. But being attuned to that and having a, a workforce that actually looks like uh, partners within the region. And you saw some wonderful imagery there, uh, both from Mark uh, and from Matt in their presentations. Our, work, our workforce today is rich for, with uh, so many different uh, cultures throughout our region. So we represent, actually, our region as well. 
So being identifiable uh, from that perspective is also a great step forward to understand um, what it is they may require. I'll go back to the first question. In changing our ADF capabilities to deal with emerging regional challenges, especially but not only in the South and East China Sea, what force-related changes or capabilities would you like to see introduced and strengthened? For me, it's got to do with energy. Um, and so, um, if we're talking about resilience, uh, it would be interesting to have a, dis uh, a discussion on uh, energy, resilience and diversity. Uh, a lot of our platforms and capabilities uh, either have a single source of energy in order to drive them, uh, in order to, for us to project uh, and sustain uh, military power forward. So energy to me uh, is a crucial one. And when we look at the lens through the lens of resilience, um, it might sometimes helpful to look at the lens through mobilisation. So if we had to mobilise the nation, you sort of start to understand uh, where our resilience gaps actually have. I'm not saying we are going to mobilise the nation, but I think it's insightful to look at it through that lens. Yeah, from my point of view, it's important to maintain interoperability with our leading partners. So um, there's no point us having a particular weapon system or capability that we then can't share information or data with our partners to be able to, um, to support each other. I think the other piece for me, uh, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, is actually around our logistics sustainment. So it's one thing to be able to get our forces to a location. Uh, there is a, a lot that's required in order to sustain and, and maintain them in that location. And uh, look, look that's, that's not to say that we're not adequate in that space at the moment, but as, as we continue to change and as technology enables us to do different things, I think there's a lot for our logistic supply and sustainment as well. And I'll certainly reinforce that point. And as Gerald Campbell says, it's only, only impressive if you can sustain it. Uh, and that is one of the challenges for a, a small organisation like the Australian Defence Force. Uh, so sustainability is a big thing. The other point I'd highlight is um, while we talk about risks and ambiguity around uh, what's happening to our north, um, for me that underscores the importance of the know and understand capabilities. So uh, understanding again what our vital interests are, our vital terrain is, uh, and investing in those capabilities that um, enable us to cut through the ambiguity so we really understand what, what is happening and what it means for Australia, what we can uh, and, if possible, must do. Uh, so I, I guess the ISR capabilities, I see Alex nodding, um, means I'm on the right track, Norman. Next question. Now that the ADF has formally been tasked with assisting with the challenges of Australian continental resilience, what changes would you see needing to be made to make this resilient role more achievable? That's an easy one, more people. Uh, and again, our, our workforce of the Navy is designed to animate the fleet and to deploy it and to sustain it on operations. Uh, it's not designed to concurrently release 500 people to COVID task force, which is what we've largely sustained for the last few months. Uh, and every time you pull a handful of people out of a team, uh, you weaken the team. Uh, and if the remainder are left there to look after the ship alongside, then they're working twice as hard because there are holes in the team. So for me to sustain a contribution to a broader set of missions, uh, you need to either reduce the demand signal uh, on the force and spread it more evenly across those people who are in it. Or if you can't do that, uh, and in a, in a contemporary setting where our deployed operations are uh, directly connected to our national interest, uh, the only other option is to increase the number of people in the pool. Yeah, look, I'm, I don't have much to add other than I'd say prioritisation becomes really important. And so uh, focused activities or events uh, are achievable. Um, sustaining them for long periods of time will probably come back to, as the fleet commander said, uh, that means that we're not able to do another essential task. And so prioritisation becomes the, uh, the important element there. And one final point uh, on that, and uh, I echo the sentiments of both Mark and Matt. Once again, look through the lens of mobilisation. I think from a national resilience perspective, it's got to do with force posture. Uh, so if you look at the size of our nation, uh, we're pretty much, uh, our population centres are sparsely distributed, mostly on the southeast coast. Uh, we have uh, 
uh, as being an air force where we go to, uh, we have bases in places that no one wants to live. You know, from a resilience perspective, that comes challenging from a sustainment and a projection point of view as well. So I think our, our actual review of our force posture is going to be inherent to understanding our overall national resilience uh, and building up uh, stronger connections and more diverse uh, inflows and outflows of logistics, without a doubt. Just remind people that uh, currently you can fit the whole of the Australian Defence Force, both as full-time and as part-time members into the Melbourne Cricket Ground, very comfortably. That's uh, pre-COVID. <laughs> So it's not a very big uh, defence force. Um, the last question I've got here before I open to the floor, uh, how can the RUS on New South Wales assist in supporting your command in fulfilling its responsibilities? I guess I'll start with my final point uh, and the analogy I used is, what is it that you think we are blind to? What is it the things you think we're not actually looking at or haven't looked at deep enough as well? Um, I, and I know uh, the membership of RUSI will acknowledge and understand there are so many things that Defence can explicitly explore and study. And so that to me is the value of organisations such as this, is to ask the questions that you might understand are being asked but can't be challenged. Um, and so organisations such as this is a really good partnership for us uh, to keep us honest. Yeah, my, my point's exactly the same. It's around the contest of ideas. So, uh, you know, we improve ourselves by challenging ourselves and, and you know, challenging those customs and, and traditional ways we've always done things. Now, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic's been a wonderful forcing function to think differently about the way we might operate and, and technology's enabling us to do things differently as well. But um, I, I think from a... Um, from a think tank point of view, from an industry and academia point of view, uh, that they're always, it's a partnership, right? And so that relies on listening as much as what we speak. And, and so we're certainly open to good ideas wherever they may come from. Yeah, I guess I'll just challenge the status quo. I think my, uh, my horizon is really about two years. Uh, and my focus is on optimising the fleet and being. Uh, it is, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, you, go, you go to war with what you've got. So that tends to focus the three of us on the here and now, whereas we talked about Canberra at the beginning, uh, Canberra needs to be focused beyond that. So I would say that, uh, particularly for industry partners, uh, you will sense and, uh, and be in touch with technologies that are beyond my horizon, uh, outside my field of view, uh, and when you sense an opportunity to rapidly bring to bear new capability, um, I'm really interested. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd say is just explaining our capability in context. Right, there is, uh, and I'll point to the submarine conversation, there's big submarines and there's small submarines. You can drive across the Nullarbor in a Volkswagen made in 1963, or you can drive across the Nullarbor in a Land Rover made in 2021. Uh, the mission's the same, the two capabilities are a little different. Same thing applies to small, uh, small jets, uh, long range fighter planes. Uh, same thing applies to a very small tank with thin armour uh, and, and an up armoured tank uh, and, and submarines and surface ships. So I think there's a lot of conversation. Um, I think Rusi uh, really has a lot of expertise and experience that can be brought to bear to um, upskill perhaps that conversation in many respects. Thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, Commodore Michael Flynn, uh, can you stand up and introduce yourself uh, and a short question? I guess probably one of the Thank you. Thank you, facilitator. Uh, Commodore Flynn, uh, member of the United Service Institute in New South Wales. Look, uh, I'm getting my birthday, 75th birthday. birthday. And uh, so I'm close to 80 than 70. For the first time in my life, I saw an elderly uh, gentleman in army uniform wearing his National Service medals, his father's medals and his grandfather's medals, leaning on his walking frame in Melbourne, uh, making an impassioned speech that uh, I've never heard anything like it. And I guess it's a question of uh, preparedness or resilience against the forces that are not so obvious, like fire and flight. 
but the issues that we're now um, facing now, and I, I guess it's a question of how do we get inform, preserve, or protect our moral or our psychological resilience or our national capital. I think it uh, comes down to uh, we are a force uh, that is founded upon values and behaviours and our values of our defence force are the things that hold us true, keep us aligned uh, to the Australian population. So having a values based organisation first and foremost uh, I think is the one that actually keeps us with that, that moral uh, perspective. Uh, we're also a defence force and, uh, and a government that deals with truths and not half-truths. Uh, now that's a challenging concept to talk about when we uh, have notions such as operations in the grey zone. What does that actually mean? Uh, and so that's where uh, we have uh, drawn a line from a Western democratic society perspective is that you know, this is our fight and this is what it means for us. And so the, the impassioned uh, pleas about what's important, uh, I think that, that they still need to come. Uh, that's why we, uh, if not lie awake at night, sometimes wake up at night, uh, just checking ourselves that uh, are we staying true to that particular cause. But I think that's the inherent nature of our defence force, uh, that is that common value. And as uh, was brought out in that article most recently by uh, Air Vice Marshal John Blackburn, as well about national resilience, it's about having a shared understanding. And that's the same thing about any uh, principle of war, you know, unity of effort. Are we on the same sheet of music? If you're on the same sheet of music, you've got you know, uh, half a chance of actually uh, having success. Uh, can I just uh, raise one last question before we break up? Is there a risk uh, in relation to uh, the considerable amount of domestic operations and aid of the civil community uh, that we're going to lose our war fighting skills? How do you maintain them? We've got a whole team out doing other things other than their essential war fighting skills. So I, might, I might start because armies uh, had, as the largest of the three services, had a significant commitment um, and it's come uh, predominantly, we've shared it around the organisation but at different points in time we've, we've focused it uh, firstly out of South East Queensland, so our Brisbane based brigade extensively used our army reserve across the country and, and then we transferred that responsibility from Brisbane across to, to Darwin. Um, so from an army point of view, uh, for us, we can't train across the full set of requirements all the time. So we look at what, what are the essential elements, what are our foundation core skills, um, and then when we get the capacity, we train above and beyond that. And that capacity uh, comes from training uh, with the other services, comes from training with our regional partners and, and international allies. So it, it, again, uh, for me, it comes down to prioritisation. You can't do everything all the time, but um, supporting our community is exactly what we're here to do. Um, that was the mission that was needed, and so we had to uh, had to ensure that that was successful. Working with a lot of other agencies, uh, it's not, uh, and no one's suggesting that it is, but certainly defence was just a bit player in a in a much larger piece. So I think um, across the whole community, everyone's certainly done their bit. Um, and from our point of view, uh, we were grateful to be able to focus on war fighting uh, school when, we, when we've had the chance. And the example I gave from Corporal Jensen out of Townsville, so our, our Townsville and our Darwin brigades had, had both done major war fighting exercises with coalition partners uh, this year. Um, you, you wouldn't think that COVID had occurred uh, with the training that we've been able to conduct. I think there is a risk of fatigue across the workforce and there are risks to the supply chain. Uh, there are things that we would normally have in country, spare parts, etc., that are held up overseas. Um, but in terms of war fighting readiness, we can walk and chew gum. Uh, and we haven't cancelled a single war fighting force generation activity with the Navy um, during the pandemic. I've got a destroyer deployed at the moment, a frigate deployed, uh, deployed. both of them have just come out of Japanese ports, uh, but some are in deployed. We've got one of our new tankers doing first class flight trials with helicopters. We've got a mine hunter on our way having completed on our way home having completed a circumnavigation of Australia um, and a major mine clearance activity uh, exercise over in Western Australia. We've maintained our uh, five plus patrol boats on border protection duties. Um, yeah, but it's November. Uh, this time of year the force is usually a little weary. 
Um, some aspects of the force have had a bit, bit more rest. Some people have been working from home and, uh, and whilst they haven't taken leave, doesn't necessarily mean they're more tired than what they were. Uh, there's been domestic stress associated with this. So uh, overall, uh, from a warfighting uh, preparedness perspective, um, I don't think we've missed the date. Uh, and to Matt's point, you don't maintain everything at that constant readiness all the time. We have met the CDF preparedness directive uh, day in, day out. Um, but yeah, most of the risks around the workforce space, I think, uh, and particularly um, it's the impact on families. Now, everything we achieve in uniform um, is enabled by and sometimes at the expense of the family unit. Uh, and that creates um, uh, additional pressure on the serving members. So I think that's where we're going to, we'll, we'll understand the impacts, I guess, uh, probably six months after the last lockdown uh, in real context. is that you can have a talk to the, uh, the most three, three of the most senior ADF commanders uh, in Australia here over a cup of tea, whereas in the other countries, including our allies, there'd be a, an army of se a security detail out there uh, watching over them. And this is a great, uh, wonderful asset that we can still do. So please let them have a cup of coffee before you uh, ask them a question. Uh, and can you please join when we thank our three speakers.